Good evening all. So I welcome Dr. Sujaya Ray, sir, Assistant Professor in IQ City Medical College, Durgapur. So today he is with us to teach us examination of psychiatric case, uh, mental state examination. So I welcome you, sir, on, in amidst this pandemic, you are, came forward to just teach the students. I thank you so much. Now I just hand over the session to Dr. Sujai, sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, great. So, uh, good evening, everyone. I will be uh, today. I will take a class on how to examine a case in psychiatry. And the actually, the examination in psychiatry is different, obviously, as you may understand from physical examination. So, we call this a mental state examination of a patient of any uh, of a case of psychiatry. So, just like in medicine, you have uh, examinations of different systems, cardiovascular, respiratory, those things, or surgery, surgery you, will, you will have a examination, orthopedic examination is specific. So similarly, psychiatric examination is also having some specific thing. And I will be discussing those things. So this is just to give you the steps of the examination or what are the things you see in the examination of a uh, case uh, presenting to you in a, with psychiatric features. So uh, so coming to uh, the outline of today's presentation, we'll first talk about the importance of what psychiatric examination is. What is the, there are some initial things which we have to keep in mind before we start a psychiatric examination. There's some things which are quite general, which are, which you can look, you can uh, uh, tell those things in the first glance itself or in a, a few minutes. Then there are some specific things about psychiatric aspects where you have to ask specific questions to the uh, patient to understand those things and then there are some bordering aspects which are which it is a, it is actually a part of both neurological and psychiatric examination but still we have kept it as a part of psychiatric examination so those uh, aspects also i will be discussing uh, specifically so coming to an importance of examination in psychiatry now as you all probably know that there aren't very many diagnostic tests in psychiatry like for medicine surgery you have like lots of diagnostics, there's blood picture, this, those things are there, markers are there. But for psychiatry, you don't really have any markers. Of course, there are advanced studies going on genetic markers and those things. So for depression and those things. So those are actually mostly diagnosis through history and uh, examination. Of course, there may be some organic causes, like if there is a brain tumor, which is pressing onto some lobe of the brain and causing some psychiatric symptoms. So that is a different thing. Of course, you can find those things out, but otherwise the diagnosis is mostly through history and examination. And history is also sometimes non-specific. Uh, if you don't have any other person, if only the patient is giving you, you are not able to co corroborate the history. And sometimes patients, uh, patients who have psychiatric problems may not be able to give you history. The, the history, sorry, the history may not be uh, specific. The history may not be uh, may not be easily forthcoming because if the person is very depressed, a person is uh, psychotic, violent, agitated, or, uh, uh, you know, so that is that time it's very difficult to obtain the history. So you need some tests or some kind of features which you can do by observation. And that is, that should be objective in nature rather than sometimes history of, I mean, diagnosis of many sub psychiatric disorder becomes subjective that one person may feel that the patient is depressed. One person may feel that this is a normal variation of mood. It is not depression, but there are some tests which should be there, which should be objective and based on observation so that's why we have psychiatric examination now before you start a psychiatric examination you have to keep some things in mind so first you should do a physical examination general physical examination what you do checking for pallor ectoras some basic uh, 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 auscultation basic neurological movements so those basic examinations you should finish in the beginning itself it is not that you leave it after the psychiatric examination because if there are some physical abnormalities you have to first uh, take care of that then you have to check the patient's sight, hearing him, because this is a question, means examination means this is more as asking questions to the patient. So if the patient cannot hear you well, or the patient cannot see things well, or the patient cannot understand, then you can't have a reliable psychiatric examination. And cooperativeness, patient should be cooperative, patient is acutely agitated, or the patient is so depressed that there's nothing, it's just looking down and there's no words coming from his mouth, then it's difficult to do a psychiatric examination then for an agitated patient first you have to calm him down by giving a sedative or things like that so that is why uh, that is uh, why you should keep these things in mind before you start the psychiatric examination 
now we start with some general aspects of a person so you first look at the general appearance of the patient how is he built nourished you have this in your general physical examination also so simple things like in case of for example depression if the person is depressed and the person what happens there is low mood then the person doesn't eat well the person doesn't take care of himself so you will find that the person is unkempt hairs are not proper the person is looking thin uh, shabbily dressed so these are some basic things which you can find in the general appearance similarly if the person has had the psychos psychosis episode and has been violent you may see some injuries over there you may see some uh, stigma of alcoholic uh, alcoholic liver disease in your general appearance itself so this is this is something which you can do as i said when you do the physical examination you can actually merge this general appearance part with the physical examination itself then coming to rapo rapo what does it mean it's actually a basic english word it mean word it means that what is the harmony now between the patient and the examiner so whether the patient and the examiner is able to establish a rapport are you able to get a means that that is something which you will understand in the beginning is the patient willing to have contact uh, willing to speak with you or the patient is very suspicious or is openly refusing openly angry with you so you can understand that if if you feel that if you find that rapport is difficult to establish that harmony is difficult to establish it could mean just for example it could mean that if the for, for example if a person is psychotic and is suspicious psychosis is one of the symptoms i will discuss later is delusions so if the person is deluded that is he has some fixed belief that somebody is trying to harm him or he suspects the examiner so you will have a difficulty in establishing a rapo with such a person you will also have a difficulty again in establishing a rapo with person who is severely depressed very suicidal those kinds of things so whereas certain other people who are not psychotic who are not depressed maybe they are anxious but at least in anxiety the person will actually establish a rapport with you and he'll actually be happy to share his anxieties because he wants to get rid of them so that rapport whether it that harmony is easy to establish or difficult to establish it can give you a clue what kind of disease you are dealing with then coming to eye contact again so now if the person is suspicious then the person will not maintain eye contact with you you will be looking here and there or he will he will keep his eyes downcast as you can see he, and he, especially in depression the person will uh, have the patient will always have a permanently down uh, downcasted eyes looking down looking depressed you can actually make out that the expression of the face is some uh, faces uh, can can give you a clue that this person is sad and the person is depressed then there is something called as abnormal movements like for example ticks now ticks what kind of movements are ticks like here you can see this picture this child i mean this is not a live i could not put a video but this child is jerking its his head towards the right side so this sudden jerking movements which we call as twitch suddenly there will be some contraction of one muscle or a group of muscles sudden jerky movements will be there those movements are called as tics so those movements again that is a borderline between neurology and psychiatry but there are certain disorders i will uh, tell about one of them later on when we get to the end of this so that those kinds of disorders which are actually both which are actually of neurological origin but can have psychiatric features also so those disorders can be made out by observing the patient similarly if instead of tics if you are seeing some tremors if you are seeing shaking of the hand then tremors can be a feature of alcohol withdrawal tremors can be a feature of uh, extreme anxiety so those kinds of abnormal movements you can just see at the patient or at the most you can ask the person to hold out the hands or something like that and hold out the hands or make the any particular movement you can ask the person to do which will make the uh, those abnormal movements will become very prominent and they'll be e easily visible so this is also something you can find on the general appearance then coming to the motor behavior of the person means the motor what is the person doing is he sitting calmly so when uh, if 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 the person comes in and takes a seat calmly that is one type of motor behavior or is the person agitated if the person comes and sits but he says that he is not able to Uh, sit in one place. He is feeling agitated. He is feeling restless. So, in case of very severe depression, usually, I mean, you can have two types of severe depression. You can either have a severe depression where the person is completely immobile, not moving, face is downcast, not speaking at all, or you can have an agitated form of depression where the person is depressed, but he is at the same time he is not sitting calmly. He is crying and he is moving around. Then, almost many all the psychiatric disorders can present with agitation, mania. what these disorders are i will discuss later in another class but psychosis mania psychosis withdrawal of substances so all these disorders 
they can cause the person to be agitated withdrawal of a substance alcohol withdrawal can cause the person to be tremulous agitated sweating psychosis the person is suspicious and it's constantly suspecting or wants to run away or the person can be violent so he can be agitated so by just observing the motor behavior of the person also you can get some clues on how what the diagnosis can be then speech this is very important now usually the speech of a person is spontaneous so whatever the person speaks he comes and he just starts speaking to you whereas in case of depression again if we see depression he, the spontaneity of the speech will be reduced or in case of psychosis the person will be suspicious and he will not be engaging in any kind of speech or engaging in any kind of conversation with the doctor so the rate of the speech the speech will be uh, in in psychosis in depression in certain conditions like that the speech will not be spontaneous you will have to try to speak to the patient then coming to the rate rate means how many words is the person is how how fast is the person speaking is he speaking very fast or is he speaking very slow in in certain disorders like mania so mania is an abnormal elevation of the mood the person is abnormally happy abnormally cheerful talking too much so there the uh, rate of the speech will be increased similarly in depression the rate of the speech will be decreased as i said it may speech may not even be spontaneous then volume means how loud is the volume again if the person is severely agitated or the person is in a state of very high mania where the person is abnormally happy then the volume will be loud then coming to output how many words like you can specifically say how many words per minute is the person speaking how rapidly is this person speaking so that output will be increased in conditions like mania if the person is abnormally happy then the number of words the person speak as well as the speed the rate at which the person speaks that will be very high then in depression or in conditions like dementia dementia is a condition of uh, you may be knowing that there is loss of memory uh, and among other things so for example in alzheimers and all so in those kinds of situation the words will be reduced if the person is depressed the word he'll speak less words or if the person is in a state of dementia or memory difficulties are there then he will be speaking less because he'll not be able to find any words what to speak because he's forgetting those words because there's a memory loss so that is output of a speech can be one of the features then coherence means clarity of the how clear is the speech is the speech muddled Uh, the words are mixing up together or you cannot understand the word and also relevance so whether the uh, person is relevantly applying uh, means what is the person is say, saying does it make sense is it uh, applicable to the question you have asked or is it applicable to the current situation or he is just talking things which don't make sense so for example in substance withdrawal there is a condition which is called as delirium but just to remember that in very severe substance withdrawal the person speech will be abnormal the person will not be replying relevantly if you ask him that ask him a certain question he'll not be able to reply relevantly and the coherence the clarity of the voice will also be disturbed so that could be another kind of clue but anyhow you should uh, record speech under these particular headings and then depending on what type of speech you are finding you can think of a clue that what this disorder or what is what is it that you are dealing with when you see that particular patient then we come to some specific aspects that is psychiatric aspects now there is something called as affect and there is something called as mood now first i will start with mood what does mood mean mood simply means that what is the patient's emotional state you have to ask this this question you have to ask the patient you cannot look at the patient and find out his emotional state or state of his mind you have to ask the patient what is your mood or how are you i mean don't say you the word mood just say that how are you feeling are you fe how are you feeling and then the patient will tell you i am feeling happy sad angry whatever so that thing which the patient tells you that's why this is in a different color this is called as mood so mood is something which is reported this is reported by the patient the patient will tell you i have been feeling low i have been feeling angry or whatever it is and this is sustained i mean mood is a situation mood is a uh, mood is an aspect which is always measured over a period of last few days like the patient will tell you that i have been feeling sad for the last few days or i have been feeling sad for the last few weeks or whatever it is now affect is you know what is the meaning of the word affect affect means what do you observe now if you look at this picture you can see that there is this lady who's probably depressed from the way he looks like because she is, has downcast eyes you can look how the general appearance is so by with those features you can make out i mean you can assume that the lady is depressed but this is your 
uh, interpretation. So you are saying that the effect of this lady or the effect of this patient is sad or it is depressed based on what? Based on the observation of the face. So that is why effect is a feature which is examined by you. It's not reported by the patient. The patient is not saying that, look, my face is uh, like this, so I am sad. This is something you are doing. This is your observation and it is at that point of time. So this is a cross-sectional phenomena. What, how the patient has been feeling for the last four days or last four months that the patient has to report. That is his mood. But what you are seeing at that point of time is the effect of the patient, which you are seeing when the patient has walked into your clinic. So that is a cross-sectional phenomena. That is a at, at that time phenomena. And this is examined by you, not reported by the patient. So that is the difference between effect and mood. So as I so again, mood is reported by the patient and effect is recorded or observed by you. Generally, in a psychiatric examination, we just uh, record the effect because mood becomes actually to be honest mood becomes a part of history because that is a history of when you're taking history you are asking the patient how you have been feeling for the last four, few days or few months so that is what is uh, mood and whereas what we record in psychiatric examination is affect so that is affect now again if we look at affect in detail what are the things so one thing is the quality of the effect does the person look depressed angry happy whatever or you can uh, you, you you can look at the face and say what the person looks like does it look like anxious uh, now coming then we come to the range so when you are doing the msc or when you must have taken the history the person must will have displayed different emotions during the interview sometimes he may have become happy sometimes he may have become a little sad while he is talking about some life experience or even during your psychiatric examination mental state examination you may be asking some questions and Seeing the difference in the affect, his facial expression will keep changing. So that range of emotions or range of, I should actually say, range of expressions because you are observing the expression, emotion, you are not observing, you are observing the expression. So the range of expressions during the interview, that is, that is the range of the affect. Now, if you look at some psychotic disorders, the range is reduced. So in psychotic disorders, the range will be reduced. The person will not be able to express happiness or sadness. All the time, it will be just anxiety, just fearfulness all the time. Then in certain depressed, uh, in certain disorders, depression, there the range is restricted to one end, always sad. There is no happiness at all. So in those situations, the range of the affect gets uh, changed or rather the range of the affects becomes reduced or restricted to one particular end. So that is called as the range. Then coming to congruence. Now, just now I told you that mood is something which is reported by the patient. And whereas affect is something which you see uh, by uh, see uh, by your observation. Now, sometimes it may happen in certain psychiatric disorder that the patient says that he is happy or she is happy, but clearly you can see on the affect that the person looks sad or the other way around may also happen. Okay, just give me a second. I think this is done. Okay. Yeah. Hello. It's okay now. Yeah. So, um, so as I said, mood is something which is reported by the patient, whereas affect is something which is uh, recorded or observed by you. So sometimes it may happen that the patient says that I am very happy, but clearly the patient looks sad. Or sometimes the patient actually says that I am very sad. And when you look at the affect, you can see that the patient is actually laughing. So these kinds of problems happen. When these kinds of problems happen, that means the there is a problem with the congruence of the effect. And this, this, this happens usually in psychotic disorders that the person reports something else or the person looks something else. So that, that you have to find out by, uh, you will have asked in the history about the mood and then you have to see the effect of the person. And then you have to find out whether they both are congruent or both are similar or not. So that can be disturbed in psychotic disorders. Then the next thing is about reactivity. Also, it's uh, there is a word called liability. So reactivity basically means how qu quickly these changes happen. So how quickly these changes happen is called as the reactivity. I mean, so that, that is called the reactivity of the effect. So if the 
person has uh, person has any uh, number i told you that the range is the range of the emotions what are the different emotions the person has expressed and how quickly the emotions change that is called the reactivity or liability again in depression the there will be no, there won't be any changes between the emotions so the reactivity will be reduced in depression or in psychosis now we come to thought so the, again this is something which we have to ask the uh, patient in detail that uh, about his or her thoughts so what basically is there what is included in the thoughts you have to see there is one thing uh, called as the content of the thought content means basically what is the patient thinking about that's that is what is called content now the content in the thought when we see we see two uh, two things mainly one is suicidal ideation i mean we have to simply ask the patient that look do you feel that uh, you feel you do you feel suicidal or do you feel that you wish that you would be dead Th things like that so that is the that that is the question we must ask to understand whether the person has suicidal ideation or not then the other thing is delusions now what is delusions i have also covered in a separate class but i'll briefly just tell, tell you i'm sure that you would be familiar with this word but delusions is a type of false belief false belief in uh, psychosis psychotic disorders or schizophrenia that the that there is no uh, uh, evidence for that belief and still the person believes it for example a delusion of persecution means that the person believes that he might be attacked by someone or in delusion of reference the person believes that people are talking about him so those aspects need to be explored over here and you have to ask a very specific questions now the other thing the second thing about thought is form and stream so one thing is content means what is the person thinking about is he thinking about suicidal right uh, thinking about suicide does he have any false beliefs those kinds of things and form and stream means that how are these thoughts arranged how 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 is he thinking what how is he thinking whatever he is thinking how are those thoughts arranged in his mind so how to understand that that you have to understand by something called as a speech sample now what are the abnormalities what is a speech speech sample as the name suggests it's simply you ask a patient to talk about something neutral like say tell me about the weather or tell me about uh, say some sport cricket or some neutral topic like that you ask him to talk for a minute or for 30 seconds whatever now and you record whatever speech whatever he speaks in those 30 seconds 20 seconds you record that and what are the things you should look for or what are the abnormalities these are just a few examples so these are some three abnormalities three of the abnormalities you can find in a speech sample circumstantiality derailment and flight of ideas now i'll just give you some examples to make you understand for example here i i ask a simple question tell me about your breakfast or tell me what did you have for breakfast now you look at the first response of the patient breakfast was the first meal my meal is important important things are present every day every day is now you you see in this what is happening i asked him to talk about his breakfast but he went from breakfast to meal to important to every day and then he'll talk other things he'll talk about every day then he'll uh, say what are the days of the week so you can see what happened you start with a particular topic but he rapidly changed from one topic to another one topic to another just he's picking up some cues from the previous sentences so this phenomena is some called as flight of ideas so this rapidly your thoughts i told you that stream uh, stream and form means how are your thoughts arranged so these thoughts this is how the flight abnormality in the stream uh, represents is is uh, is seen that is the flight of ideas so basically their flight means one after the other the person is having ideas and he is not able to stick to that one particular question which the person uh, which has been asked to him now conversely up, up, uh, on the other extreme you have something called as circumstantiality so circumstantiality look at over there so he talks something totally unrelated and he goes round and round and round i so i asked him about breakfast he's saying like he he has food that is important for my health that is what builds me gives me energy energy is important and then finally he comes to breakfast so what is the difference between these two in flight of ideas the person started with something started with the relevant point but he went he went from one place to other and until he he completely lost the uh, topic and whereas in the second one the second one is actually circumstantiality here the person is going round and round and talking about unrelated topics but eventually he is at the last coming back to the point of breakfast so this is actually circumstantiality will be a very long 
speech sample i have just put a short example here so so that is the difference between the two derailment is something in between the two so in flight of ideas you have rapid jumping from one topic to another derailment also what happens is that the person goes off the topic but it is not as rapid as flight of ideas and circumstantiality he goes round and round and finally comes down at the last uh, at the very last he finally comes and answers the question which has been asked to him so these are some of the abnormalities which you can find in a person's speech and this this is what is meant by the tree of a thought so there can be many examples of this and there can be many other abnormalities of thought and speech which i have no, uh, thought in the speech sample which i have not uh, told here maybe these can be discussed in more detail in a later class but this is the general idea of the tree of a thought now coming to some phenomena about thoughts so this 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 is also something you can uh, explore in a mental state examination this is this phenomena the, uh, the various phenomena of thought which you can explore are insertion withdrawal and broadcasting so again i have taken a separate uh, class on schizophrenia but uh, these uh, aspects are unique to schizophrenia and here what happens is the person feels that people are inserting new thoughts into my mind so again when you try to make a speech sample of uh, this person the you will find that suddenly some new unknown topics have been inserted into the speech sample so he'll be talking about breakfast and then suddenly talk about something else withdrawal means the person feels that his thoughts are being taken away so he will find a difficulty again he will find a difficulty in the uh, continuity of the thoughts he will feel that his thoughts are being taken away and broadcasting is not exactly a, a problem with the speech sample here the person feels that whatever he is thinking other people are coming to know of it and other people that's why he will become very suspicious and it will be very difficult for him to uh, think clearly so he feels that everybody is uh, coming to know about his thoughts so these are the three thought phenomena uh, which are present you have to ask very direct questions to this person to understand these thought phenomena then coming to the aspect of perception so what is perception you have to ask uh, what is the person uh, seeing hearing so perception as you know there are five senses uh, sight smell hearing and you have to ask about all of them so basically what you have to ask is if there is any abnormal perception so what do you mean by abnormal perception for example if there is anything which the person is perceiving without any stimulus there is no stimulus but the person is still able to perceive it maybe he is able to hear a voice which is not there he can see something which is not there or he can feel something or we can smell something taste something so those aspects are called as hallucinations hallucinations are a, a detailed topic to be discussed and I, i have discussed them again in another class but here again simply to give a overview that hallucination is anything which there is a, there is no stimulus but the person keeps perceiving those things so you have to simply ask the person whether or not he is having any experiences which uh, in which he is having a voice hearing a voice or seeing a thing which does not exist so this is again also a direct question and anyway on a uh, general appearance or an observation of the patient you can make out because the person who is hallucinating for example he is having auditory hallucination and listening to voices so he will be responding to those voices and talking and it will appear as if he is talking to himself so you can uh, judge i mean you can make out whether the person is hallucinating even on general observation then the other thing is illusions and distortions so if uh, suppose there is a correct there is a stimulus present but it is perceived in a wrong way so that is called as a illusion or distortion now to understand what is illusion and distortion you just see this for example if you see the upper figure you can see there is a coil of a rope but sometimes it may appear that the person is having a uh, what the person might see is it, it appears like a snake so that is called an illusion so this is a real perception the rope is there i mean there is a real stimulus but it is misinterpreted so this is a misinterpretation of stimulus perceive wrong perception of a stimulus which is perceived as a snake or it could be a distortion so distortion means that the size could be distorted shape could be distorted and here the for example you can see that this table is appearing smaller over here so that's a distortion again these phenomena these uh, illusion and distortion these phenomena may have an like, organic basis not very much in psychiatry but then if there are very intense emotional states if the person is very anxious very suspicious so then in that case he will he might he or she might misinterpret uh, stimulus like this and then illusions may be there 
okay now so these were the psychiatric phenomena which we discussed now we come to some phenomena which are both neurological and psychiatric which i was telling you earlier but some, uh, we have still kept it as a part of the mental state examination so the first phenomena is orientation so orientation means time place and person so what simply it means is the person know where he is who he is and what is the time or what day date it is so, so you have to simply ask him directed questions whether is this uh for for example for time you have to ask uh, what is what is the day date time as in uh, what what is the approximate time that time or uh, if you cannot ask him the exact time at least you ask him what is the, whether it is day or night you can ask him the uh, year month so those things you can ask when you are checking orientation to time it, uh, it may be of different grades i mean the paper person may not be able to tell you the day and date but they may be able to tell you may be able to tell you the month and year or something like that so it's not an all and one thing the person may have some orientation or uh, uh, no it he may be totally disoriented and may know may not know anything at all then coming to the place again you have to ask in different stages you have to ask whether the person knows where he is in the in the sense that does he know which building is it which floor of the building is it what is that city state country so those things you have to check in the orient orientation to place and orientation to person you must ask him about himself does he know who he is so his name and uh, some person it is and about somebody else if somebody is standing next to him and is his family member you can ask that who is that particular person is he able to identify him as his family member or not so that is another thing you have to check in orientation again these uh, things are disrupted in substance withdrawal for example in alcohol withdrawal one of the characteristic features in a severe alcohol withdrawal is that the person loses orientation to time place and person and orientation to a disorientation to time or losing orientation to time is the commonest uh, among uh, uh, all the other disorientation so this only disorientation to time is something which is most commonly seen then coming to memory so memory again these as i said that these things are uh, bordering between neurology and psychiatry so memory is Uh, stored in the memory is a function of the temporal lobe there is actually if you look at temporal lobe function tests separately in neurology or medicine then they will they will include some tests about the memory as well so how do you check the memory you tell the patient three unrelated words unrelated words means you uh, you tell them uh, you tell the patient any three words which are not related to each other like say apple ball and table so uh, you uh, don't tell him uh, words like pen pencil chalk those type of thing you have to tell him three words which are unrelated and then ask him to repeat that so you have to first ask him you have to first tell him that you are going to tell him three words and then ask him to repeat it back to you so you just say that apple ball table and then he says apple ball table back to you so you ask him to repeat these three three words that is that checks the immediate memory then you can uh, then the next thing you do is you tell him to remember these three words and after some time after a few minutes after a few minutes uh, you can uh, again ask him to recall and repeat those three words again so that uh, checks your recent memory so immediate memory is basically uh, talking about memory from seconds to minutes and re uh, sec uh, actually in a matter of seconds and recent memory is something which checks some uh, memory in a matter of minutes to hours or to days so to check the recent memory you can ask him to either recall the three words which were told earlier or you can ask him to recall some events that happened in the past few hours or past few days like what did he have for breakfast or where was he uh, one day before so those kinds of things can be asked to check the recent memory again in alcohol uh, intoxication the recent memory may get impaired the recent memory there is something called as korsakoff syndrome although it is called as korsakoff psychosis but there is no psychotic feature in it the feature is that the person loses the recent memory and then the person will actually invent some false memories and try to fill those gaps so that can happen in alcohol uh, intoxication and as i was saying earlier dementia where there is a memory loss so from dementia usually the person will end up losing recent memory he'll forget what he was doing yesterday he'll forget what he was doing in a couple of hours then the other part of other type of memory is remote memory so this takes uh, checks the long term memory like what is there in years so about the person's childhood about the person's first job or whatever uh, first uh, i mean when the person got married so 
things uh, which are which have happened a, a lot back in the person's memory uh, in the person's life so that checks a remote remote memory like for example if you want to see if you uh, see dementia and uh, other i mean type uh, any type of dementia but specifically alzheimer's if you see so recent memory is disturbed but surprisingly these patients retain the remote memory so that is an example of uh, a disorder where the remote memory is retained but the recent memory is disturbed so this is the this is how you can check the memory then coming to intelligence now again intelligence uh, when you say when you check a person's intelligence there are sub, uh, separate sections for that you can check the person's general fund of information general fund means simply it means general knowledge so whatever the person's expected standards i mean whatever his background is where he comes from according to that you have to frame the question you can ask questions of general knowledge like the capital of a country capital of the city uh, capital of a state then uh, the name of the current prime minister those kinds of things you can ask for a general fund of information so this is also something uh, similar to memory but still it's a little bit different uh, different because it's different from as per the person standard and then you can ask uh, you can ask the general fund then the other thing in intelligence is something called as comprehension so you have to simply ask a question and ask uh, for a patient's answer i mean you have to for example you can ask you can ask a very simple question which may have a yes or no answer like you can ask that uh, is, the, is this place a hospital and then he'll say if you're doing the interview in a hospital then he'll say yes but again those kinds of simple questions will may check for orientation rather than comprehension so you can ask a person a question uh, like for example you can show you can you can ask him a question like suppose if you are in the rain if if you are going outside in uh, going outside you are walking outside and then there is a sudden uh, suddenly the, the it starts to rain what are you going to do so the logical answer to give would be that i will be seeking shelter or i will be covering myself up with my umbrella if i have one so that that kind of a question can be asked like you can uh, so that you can judge whether the person is comprehending or the uh, a person is understanding a specific situation and then he is able to frame an answer which is appropriate to that particular situation or not so that is called as comprehension again if the person only if the person can process the question properly only then can he give a correct answer to that so that is an, again a function of the temporal lobe uh, of the brain then there is something called as abstraction now this is again uh, this is a sorry uh, this this is a function of the frontal lobe of the brain and again this is impaired in certain situations like for example in schizophrenia or in, even in what we call as intellectual uh, disability disorders now what abstraction means is the ability abstraction is simply the ability to understand the uh, understand the situation in depth so for example if you ask the patient a proverb like you ask him a proverb like uh, for example that uh, as you say that a, pro, a proverb that a stitch in time saves nine now you saying that a stitch in time saves nine it basically what you are ask what the basically the proverb means is that if you do something correct if you do if you if you do the right thing at the right time it can save you a lot of trouble so that's what the uh, proverb means or uh, you if you if you uh, ask him a pro, uh, proverb that uh, all that glitters is not gold so basically what the proverb means that anything which looks nice on the surface is not uh is is not necessarily nice so that is what a proverb means but if the person is uh, person's abstraction is impaired then instead if you ask him the meaning of this uh, proverb all that glitters is not gold he will not be able to tell you that uh, what is the he will not be able to tell you the real meaning of the proverb he will simply say something like whatever glitters is not gold he'll just repeat it back to you he'll not be able to tell it uh, tell you the to tell you the in depth meaning or what that uh, what that proverb exactly means he will just repeat the things uh, same thing back to you or he will uh, just uh, he will he will just take the surface meaning and uh, tell it to you so that is called as an impairment in abstraction then coming to something called as similarity so now suppose you ask uh, the how you do this test is you ask the patient like for example you take two objects and you ask the similarity between them apple and orange now ordinarily what would a person say to this the person would say that the similarity between apple and orange is that both of them are fruits now if a person's abstraction is impaired instead of saying this that both of them are fruits he will say something like 
both of them are round or both of them look circular now that of course that is a similarity that both of them look a little circular but that's not uh, when you talk of similarity between an apple and orange that is not what you really think about you uh, think about the fact that both of them are fruits or uh, both of them are at least both of them are edible items so that is the kind of similarity which a, which normally a person would uh, would be expected to say but a person whose abstraction is impaired he will say what only similarity which you can see on the surface which which is something which is very superficial in nature so that is an in, that is how an impairment in abstraction looks like now again if you if you want to uh, other way of checking abstraction is asking him or asking the patient differences so if you ask a uh, ask the person a difference between a tv and a radio normally a person uh, a person whose abstraction is not impaired he would say that a tv can be tv is an audio visual thing and whereas the radio is just an audio thing you can just hear it whereas the person who does not know who, whose abstraction is impaired he will not be able to give you that difference he will again give be giving you some vague difference like a tv would be big and the radio would be small some kind of difference like that which may be correct but that's not the actual difference which you uh, expect when you ask a person a difference between a television and a radio so basically abstraction means that if the person is uh, not just the person should be able to see beyond what is uh, uh, expected on the surface so it's not just surface differences surface similarities or a surface meaning the person should be able to tell the actual what the actual thing is or what the actual similarity or difference is and that is called as that that phenomena is called as abstraction and again as i said this is a function of the frontal lobe then coming to an aspect called as a judgment now the, this is this is again a bit similar to what we were discussing in comprehension but again this is a the what you are trying to find out here is a little different so for example i'll first tell you what a test judgment is so you give a person a particular situation a per situation which he needs to take a decision like he he's like you tell a person that he is walking on the street and he sees that there is a building which is on fire and ask him what is he going to do or ask or tell the person that he is walking on the street and he finds a wallet which has fallen down what is he going to do now a normal response would be to say that he would inform the fire brigade if there is a, a building on fire or he would try to uh douse the fire by putting in some water by himself and for a fallen wallet he would say that i would return the wallet to a police station something like that but if you if the person's judgment is impaired uh, as it happens in again as it happens in psychotic disorders because in psychotic disorder disorders the person is really suspicious and really hostile so in those kinds of situations if in uh, in those kinds of disorders if you tell him that the building is on fire then he instead of saying that i should call the fire brigade or things like that he would probably say that those fire that fire has been set to uh, harass me that fire has been set to attack uh, has been actually set with an intention to attack me or that wallet has been put on the road because if that wallet contains a bomb and i will blow up if i touch it so if those kinds of responses are there in in case of psychosis in case of schizophrenia you will have some responses which are abnormally suspicious or abnormally uh, difficult uh, abnormally uh, difficult to understand uh, and 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 that is the kind of response if you get that kind of a response you can suspect that this person's judgment is impaired i mean uh, you can suspect that there is a disorder which is clouding a person's judgment so that is called a test judgment when you give a specific situation and a social judgment is again you can simply observe or you can ask the person that what how does he feel about himself how does he feel about the society around him again he will be in case of psychotic disorders or in case of disorders where judgment is impaired he will be giving you some abnormal answers that he feels that people are trying to persecute him people are trying to hurt him so that that would be an impairment that would be a difficulty in his social judgment so that is another aspect of mental state examination now coming to something the last thing which is called as insight so insight basically means that whether the person understands or whether the person acknowledges that he has a, a psychiatric disorder or not i mean this is a, uh, this, this is usually a question which you should ask at the very end and that's why this uh, aspect of mental state examination has been put at the end so that because if you initially start with a question like this the person might get really hostile and the person might get really angry so the question here 
is simply to be asked is that whether the person what, what is the person's opinion of himself does he feel that he has a psychiatric illness does he feel that he uh, has a, dif- a mental health difficulty so there are different answers not everybody will say the same thing there may be some people who may say that they do not have any uh, mental health difficulty at all and then there may be some people who may say that yes i do have a mental health difficulty and that's why i have come here but that those are the extremes so there could be different grades i mean uh, those are the two extremes but within them also there can be different factors uh, different stages now the stages of insight or the grade of insight like for example it is graded from 1 so it is graded from 1 to 6 so for example stage 1 is something called as total denial the person does not uh, the person completely denies it that he has any problem the person denies that he has any problem at all and this is usually with people who have been forcibly brought in who are quite violent or who have been forcibly brought in by the their relatives uh, grade 2 is the person who is unsure the person for example if a person is psychotic and he has he is hearing some hallucinations he is hearing some voices and then then the person may say that i am not sure whether these voices are my imagination or whether these voices are actually coming from outside so that kind of a thing might be there now grade 3 is when the person understands that there is something wrong but he attributes it to external factors for example in psychosis again in schizophrenia the person may say that the voices i am hearing are actually uh, from an outer source or somebody is trying to hurt me that is why i am hearing those kinds of voices so basically the person attributes the thing to external factors then grade 4 means that the person attributes it to internal factors for example the person and this this is where the this is this is a major change from grade 3 to grade 4 because here the person starts to say that perhaps there is something wrong in my mind that i have a mental illness there is some kind of uh, issues there are some kind of problems with my brain that is why i am having this uh, low mood that is why i am hearing this voices so the person basically in, uh, attributes it to internal factors then the fifth grade of insight is what we call as acceptance that the person accepts that this is this is an illness this is not just something is wrong i properly i definitely have some kind of illness and that is called as acceptance and this is also called as intellectual insight so the person accepts that he has an illness again even here also the person may accept that he has an illness but he may not be willing to take medication or he may not be willing to uh, change it he may say that the illness i do have an illness but it will go away by itself so in the next grade that is the best kind of insight or emotional insight there, there the person and th- this is the usually the kind of patient who will actually walk in to your clinic and ask you for help that look i know that i have been sad for the last few days but this is abnormal maybe this is a type of a mental illness i am he- hearing a mental illness that i am having so please i am ready to take medications and that is the best grade of insight which is possible so basically you have to check how far the person is in uh, is there it is as case, as regards insight is concerned so if you have a person with good insight it means that the psychiatric disorder has not yet become that severe and this person can be easily treated and worse the worse the insight gets it means that the psychiatric disorder is getting worse and it would be difficult to help this have convince the person or have difficult to administer medications to this person so that that is the validity of checking insight so these are the aspects so we have finished all the aspects of the mental state examination so as i said i have given you an overview with initially with some general factors then i have talked about some specific psychiatric factors like thought uh, perception affect and then i have given you some uh, idea about the neurological aspects some aspects which are both neurological and psychiatric for example memory orientation um, abstraction judgment which are actually neurological which are governed by specific lobes of the brain but they have specific psychiatric uh, manifestations and finally this insight is a last thing which you should do to understand how severe the condition of the person is and whether it would be uh, whether the person will accept medicines or not or what other ways can be done to treat the person so what i would recommend is that you could read about these things this is another type of examination called as the mini mental state examination this is again this is very specific for dementia and memory and it contains like i told you there are some aspects of frontal lobe and temporal lobe so this also contains some aspects of parietal lobe and this is much easier to do this is a shorter aspect because it does not contain uh, things like speech sample and all this is focused on memory 
and you should also read about the various functions of the lobes. For example, you saw temporal lobe is associated with memory, frontal lobe is associated with abstraction. Actually, frontal lobe is also associated with judgment and certain other disorders which may have a neuro which have a neurological basis, but have psychiatric manifestations. And you could also read about movement disorders, which I was discussing about, uh, I discussed about tics. So specifically, you can read certain movement disorders, which again have a psychiatric or neurological uh, origin, but they, they manifest more, uh, majorly as the motor disorders or movement disorders. Yeah. So that is it. And I would be maybe doing some more detailed classes on later on on some uh, the, the details of these things like thought processes, hallucinations and so on. Thank you. Hello?